Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for this special AWIN and Share a Sale webinar um, where we intend to give you a few valuable insights on the impact that the coronavirus pandemic has been having on the affiliate industry in the US and to share some perspectives from an array of different affiliate businesses on how consumer habits are changing online at the moment. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your days to join us. Apologies, there was a slight delay there. We're just setting up some final details. Um, and I hope that you'll find the next hour or so's worth of analysis, interviews and discussion extremely useful and a source of inspiration for your own businesses, whether they be as brands or agencies, affiliates or any of our other various partners. Uh, my name's Rob Davidson and I work in AWIN's global strategy team here in London actually rather than the US. Um, I work as the content analyst in the team and I'll be hosting the panel today. Mm. Now I won't be the first person you'll have heard say this but we are undoubtedly living in exceptional circumstances right now. Exceptional in ways that not many of us if any would have ever anticipated unless you obviously happen to have previously seen the film Contagion. Now, whilst the pandemic is first and foremost a public health issue, the implications for businesses are also profound with the normally quite delicate balance between supply and demand currently being thrown wildly out of alignment because of the lockdown and its uh, various consequences. So with shoppers forced to stay at home, many brands have faced having to close their physical shops and stores and furloughing staff as well as having to confront huge obstacles to their normal supply chains and delivery logistics. For those businesses that have quickly adapted or had already established e-commerce presence, there's been a subsequent increase in online traffic in many but importantly not all sectors where consumers are compelled to now search, review and transact online and that's all having a significant impact on the affiliate industry. So today We'll be asking a selection of affiliates how they are adapting to the current predicament, what trends they've tracked over the course of the last few months and how they're engaging consumers during the crisis. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. And on that panel, I'm delighted to say we have a fantastic selection of guests incorporating perspectives from right across the industry and across a wide variety of publishers and uh, platform models. So um, we have Jennifer Pina, Global Director of Brand Partnerships at Magic Links. Um, unfortunately, Chris Lloyd, um, who's General Manager at Reviewed, wasn't able to make this uh, webinar today as planned. Um, but we still have Chris Menenti, Director of Commerce Strategy at Discovery. Dennis O'Reilly, Business and Development, uh, Business Development and Partnerships Director at Button and Amar Shah, Senior Director of Consumer Business at Affirm. So I'll be speaking to each of our panelists shortly and putting a series of questions to them. But we'd also really love to hear from you in the audience. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, then please type it out within the Q&A panel of the webinar, which I think you should see towards the top right corner of the uh, panel at the moment. Uh, your questions can then be voted on by the rest of the audience. And once we're finished with our initial discussions, I'll put some of your questions to our guests as well. First of all, though, I did want to give you a quick insight into some of the top level trends that we've been tracking at AWIN and share a sale in the US to provide some initial context to the discussion. So to start off with, from a sector based perspective, the trends we've seen are probably as you would expect. The data in these slides is based on what we've tracked from March 1st through to April 15th, covering the larger part of the crisis so far in the US. And now this slide specifically outlines the relative growth and decline that we've seen in sales for each of these sectors over that period when compared to the same period last year. Travel has inevitably, given the restrictions it currently faces, taken the biggest hit, while the finance industry has also witnessed some decline too where we've seen much more positive growth in the telecoms and particularly the retail sectors as consumers are increasingly turning to online options to buy their goods and services. Go to the next slide. Uh, looking closer at the travel industry, we can see just how profoundly impacted the sector has been by the outbreak and the subsequent restrictions that were put in place. 
So year on year performance was actually looking extremely good right up until the US recorded its first official case of COVID-19 on January 26. Overnight, though, we witnessed a massive drop off in demand and that decline continued over the next few weeks, dropping dramatically again following President Trump's announcement of a travel ban from Europe on March 11th. Now, whilst it's a long road to recovery from here for the travel industry, we are perhaps starting to see some of those green shoots at the moment, having recorded two consecutive weeks of growth within the sector for the very first time since the end of February. We can go to the next slide. Taking a deeper dive into the growth we've witnessed in retail, it's fascinating to see which specific subcategories are actually contributing to the increase that we've seen. And it seems that the novel experience of spending more time at home is fueling a rise in certain niche areas with more people undertaking DIY projects, for instance, or working out at home or possibly just wanting more casual sportswear to wear around the house and more consumers buying books and online subscriptions, which include a number of online entertainment options, which have inevitably seen a huge rise in demand at the moment. In fact, as an indicator of that growth in appetite for subscription based entertainment, I saw it was widely reported yesterday that Netflix had added almost another 16 million subscribers worldwide to its user base over the course of the lockdown. Now, it's also worth noting the rise in demand that we've seen in the gifts and flowers subcategory, with more people buying and sending gifts to loved ones online via online merchants. And this is a trend that may well increase in further in the coming weeks with Mother's Day due, of course, on May the 10th in the US. And uh, most people likely still to be unable to see their parents in person. And finally, obviously, I couldn't not reference the increase we've seen in the erotic subsector, a trend that we've actually seen reflected across several of our markets globally and one which perhaps speaks to other forms of entertainment that isolation is also fueling. Next slide, please. So one of the somewhat unexpected trends we've seen has been the continued growth of sales via smartphones during the period. Whilst many reports in the media had suggested that time spent online via desktop usage has grown as people are less frequently on the go now in our isolation and lockdown, We've actually seen mobile sales continue to grow over the last few weeks, and that's a trend that I think will be of particular interest to discuss with Dennis from Button shortly. Next slide. And meanwhile, the story so far for publishers is also an interesting one. Although cashback has seen some drop off in terms of sales over the period, coupon sites have held their own during the crisis, despite a lot of disruption to the retailer offers that they're featuring. By contrast, we've seen significant growth across the content and loyalty verticals and a huge uplift for comparison affiliates as well. Next slide. And finally, I wanted to just share some insight relating to the surge in demand that we've seen from new affiliates signing up to both our AWIN and share a sale platforms. In the last few weeks, we've seen an enormous uptick in new applications with thousands of new affiliates seeking to work with and promote our brands. This may in part be due to a sudden need for many people who are worried in the current climate about needing to, to supplement their incomes with additional money. However, the more recent spike we've seen is also largely down to the drastic changes that Amazon has made to its own affiliate program in the US. With commissions across many product categories being cut by more than 50% by Amazon, Many affiliates have sought to diversify their income streams by working through networks like our own and the advertisers that we offer. Around three quarters of these new publishers consist of editorial sites and influencers, and already half of them have become active on the network, suggesting their really keen desire to engage with brands and connect them to their audiences online. Now, Awin and ShareASale are offering lots of support to this influx of new affiliates right now. And we'd urge any brands or agencies that are listening right now to reach out to their account managers if they have any questions on how to handle any sudden surge in applications to their individual programs. Next slide. So having covered some of the top level trends from a network standpoint, let's now dive into what some of our partners have been seeing recently from their various perspectives. And remember, if you have a question um, that you'd like to put to any of our panelists, then please do type it out 
within the Q&A function of this webinar, and we'll ask those at the end of the session. First of all, then, we'll get a view on how the influencer industry has been impacted by the crisis by speaking to Jennifer from Magic Links, who are the global leader in authentic social commerce for YouTube, Instagram and social media influencers. So we should be able to flick over to Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to um, start just by asking you more generally speaking, I guess, how you've seen um, from Magic Link's perspective, how the influencer industry has been impacted so far by the crisis and whether you've seen many brands either pausing influencer activity or actually um, doubling down and increasing their investment at this time in the channel. Yeah, so um, much like the graphs that you showed, we've seen a about a 40% increase in the number of influencers that are producing content and, and the number of pieces of actual content. So we're mostly focused in the video space. So for us, that includes um, YouTube content, Instagram um, live, Instagram stories, IGTV, and then, of course, you know, in other mediums like TikTok. Um, so across the board, the content production has grown and the types of influencers have really diversified. So we're seeing, you know, non-traditional influencers like professional models or, um, you know, even ultra micros that maybe are hairstylists come into the space and really start to share products with their fan base um, where maybe they didn't even consider that before. Um, so it's an interesting transition that's taking place. And then in terms of um, the brand side, so brands are reacting very differently to this situation um, and obviously with good reason, you know, many are having to make um, short term cuts. Um, others are, to your point, investing more in the space. Um, so I think for many of those that are pulling back, they're also beginning to see the results of what happens when they do that. Um, so in many cases, we're seeing this kind of like yo-yo effect where um, <laughs> brands are pulling out and then, you know, a week later um, deciding to invest again. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the internal discussions that are happening on a daily basis and, um, you know, many of the, the uh, budget changes that are happening and kind of um, changes to forecasts. So, yep, yeah, it's, it's across the board, um, very diverse. Yeah. So, I mean, what tips for those brands that are investing and are continuing to um, engage with influencers at the moment? I wondered if you've got any tips for them um, and how they should be working with influencers part of their affiliate programs at the moment. Yeah, so um, our recommendation is, um, you know, slightly biased, right? But <laughs> what we see, I mean, what we see um, time and time again is that for brands that have a really strong earnings model for influencers that is, um, you know, really solid in terms of not um, having that yo-yo effect is really what provides um, more of a long-term approach and growth of the number of influencers that are producing content for you as well as um, you know the the quality of influencers that are producing. So um, you know, making sure that you are supporting your uh, very best fan base from those influencers and their really strong audience is very important. So again, having a long term view, staying the course as much as possible, and then in terms of like strategic um, uh, kind of campaigns and how you're thinking about the specific influencers to work with, whether you're investing flat fee or not. Um, being really uh, open to the, the influencer's voice and how they're speaking to the COVID era, how they're connecting with their audience. I mean, the you know we're up over you know forty percent to sixty percent in terms of click and sales volume, and the reason for that is not just because of the the flood to e-commerce, but also because you know fans and people at home are looking to those who they trust more than ever. Um, and so these influencers have, who have built this audience over time and gained that trust have, uh, you know, are starting to really drive um, incremental impact in a way that we have never seen before. Yeah. And I wanted, like you mentioned, the fact that certain influencers are having a real impact at the moment. Are there any particular instances or examples of campaigns or activity that you've seen that have really resonated? 
Yeah. So we saw a video the other day that was uh, an, an incredible video because it was very cute in a girl. Um, and I don't recall her specific name, but um, a creator that is in the macro range was up at 3 a.m. doing, you know, kind of a full face of makeup. Um, and talking to her fan base saying, I can't sleep, right? I can't sleep and why not? I don't have to work tomorrow. You know, the time is kind of at a standstill. So um, connecting with her audience in a way where it's, you know, we're all, I guess, in this together and dealing with this in a, in a number of different ways. But hey, if I'm up at 3 a.m. and I want to do a full face, like, and you're up at 3 a.m., let's do this together. <laughs> um and yeah, and from a campaign perspective, again, going back to um, having a, a really solid earnings program in place for these influencers that are quite honestly flooding into the market and being able to capture that that new audience segment is really important. Um, so as much as brands are able to stay the course, um, that will provide you returns uh, in droves in, in you know, months and years to come once we get on the other side of this. Yeah. OK, well, thanks for that overview, Jen. Um, I'm going to switch now actually to uh, Chris Menenti from Discovery Digital Studios. They're an award winning digital business uh, division of Discovery Inc that drives digital content innovation and advertising solutions through their various compelling products and experiences across multiple flat platforms. Um, hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Got it. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to kick off with you by just asking um, whether or not you've uh, witnessed this sudden surge in demand for your content since the outbreak and where specifically you've seen uh, larger spikes. Yeah, totally. Um, so we have, uh, which I think is uh, unsurprising given some of the stuff uh, that you spoke about uh, in the beginning, um, but also just the nature of our brands, right? Um, obviously, we span anywhere from uh, you know, lifestyle, you know, home and garden on HGTV to food on Food Network to, um, you know, fashion on TLC, so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as this was kind of uh, coming upon us, you know, we kind of took a step back um, as a, a media company and said, like, look, we don't want this to be an opportunistic time for us where we just try to jump on, um, you know, whatever we can, uh, you know, on uh, this unfortunate front. So basically, um, you know, we kind of rallied all the troops together and we said, look, you know, what what is our content spread for the next two to three months and what can we shift around and pivot to and, you know, kind of focus and double down on um, to really help the audience, um, you know, during a, a difficult time um, or as much as we can help uh, an audience uh, during an unfortunate situation like this. So um, mm -hmm. some of the big areas um, that we kind of um, pivoted to, uh, I think one of the no brainers is obviously grocery delivery. Um, you know, this is one of those areas that um, I think is still super new uh, to a lot of folks across the globe, especially here in the States. Uh, you know, in some of your uh, urban areas, you, you see some upticks in it. Um, but, you know, more middle of America and, and you know, certain areas um, are still kind of uneasy about it. A lot of people like to touch and feel uh, their fruits and vegetables before buying. So that's always, you know, kind of um you know uh some friction there for folks but um we've seen huge increases across um grocery delivery and like products to preserve food uh, also on kind of just like uh, the hygiene front um phone uh sanitizing products um we've seen a huge uptick there uh we had a lot of this content in the past right so a lot of it was resurfacing it getting it out front to people through you know newsletters and social uh apple news so on and so forth uh, forth and you know optimizing it um with you know price points and the best places to get it um obviously with a lot of um merchants kind of pulling back on shipping times and what's available there was a lot of uh, behind the scenes work on our end you know working with partners uh you know for instance trackonomics is a a strong partner a partner of ours so we worked with them to kind of identify you know where we have an opportunity here and and looking at you know what merchants are available and not in terms of um you know shipping and availability so on and so forth so uh, we did a lot of that um on that front uh, another no-brainer i think is organizing and cleaning products um that's kind of our bread and butter on hgtv to begin with um but we've kind of just seen that uh you know escalate um, given all the stay at home orders here um, in the States. Um, so we've really seen huge, uh, uh, you know, increases there. And, and then 
um, which this may be a surprise to some of us folks who um, live in big cities that don't have backyards and balconies and things, but um, outdoor spaces um, has also um, really took off for us. You know, this is an area um, that we always kind of see spike, um, you know, during uh, the spring months, um, but we did kind of see it start to spike before that, obviously, given the situation we're in and people um, who do have the luxury of having outdoor space, um, you know, decided to kind of um, go all in on that before um, the normal time. Uh, so we also saw uh, a lot of stuff on that front. And then generally speaking, um, to your point about DIY, um, obviously we have a DIY network. Um, same thing, we saw huge increases there um, across the board, both digitally and on linear. Um, so that was great to see as well. And I think, you know, this kind of goes back to looking at Discovery as a whole and how we really do cover all of these major, major sectors, right? So even if, um, you know, we're going through a tough time on the travel sector with Travel Channel, um, we do have all of these other brands that can really help um, audiences and folks kind of just take a step back um, and uh, avoid the hard news for a little bit um, and, and try to dive into something uh, you know, a little more light and, um, you know, hopefully interesting for them and, and helping them out during a difficult time. So um, those are, again, some of the heavy hitters. You know, there's some other smaller nuanced things as well. Um, but those are the big ones. Um, yeah. and, and again, that kind of carried into as well um, our strategy when it came to merchants and, you know, shifting a bit in terms of who we cover and don't cover and whatnot, um, because yeah. we we're really, you know, searching for uh, the best experience for uh, our audiences. Yeah, I wondered actually, I mean, online misinformation has obviously been a real chronic issue um, in the current climate. And from Discovery's perspective, I wondered if you think the, the pandemic has really helped to emphasize the value of uh, authoritative, high quality professional journalism um, or content that's being produced by, you know, authoritative content creators. Yeah, so I think in most cases, yes. Right. And uh, again, you know, Discovery being this like world known um, you know, uh, you know, entertainment, um, you know, company, uh, we kind of already had a leg up on that front, right? You know, we um, weren't trying to reinvent the wheel here and, and trying to be a little gimmicky, trying to, you know, build a brand. We have this, you know, some of the strongest brands um, around the globe. Um, and I think it really shows in times like this, right? Like I said, we were able um, to really double down on all of these things. And, you know, when people are coming to us, they're trusting us with our recommendations and suge suggestions that we're, um, you know, giving them across the board. And that's really, you know, that's really been showing, uh, you know, in, in Q1, um, you know, obviously we were forecasting uh, before uh, this global pandemic, you know, really hit here um, in the States. And we've actually blown past um, some of our stretch goals that we had um, before uh, the virus struck. So um, we are really seeing people flock to us again, um, looking for very specific types of content, um, consuming more content, just generally speaking. Um, you know, and, and again, this is really across the board. We're seeing this on newsletters, we're seeing it on social, we're seeing it on dot com, um, linear, uh, really everywhere. And I think, you know, for us, you know, it's kind of a proud moment, uh, you know, because again, as a, as a brand, we've always been hyper, hyper focused. Um, on the audience and serving them first and, you know, trying not to just chase the page view and see how quickly we could, um, you know, hit those monthly goals. This has really always been about, um, you know, serving the reader um, and giving them um, the best content for their lives. And uh, again, I, I think this was a, a, a real, um, you know, uh, eye opener um, for us as a brand to say, oh, wow, look at like, they trust us. They're coming to us during this very, an easy time, crowded time when everyone's trying to get a piece of the, the pie now um, on digital since, you know, a, a lot of advertising has been put on hold. Um, so it's really been exciting on our end to kind of see this all come together. Yeah. So do you have any kind of recommendations for brands that are willing to, or looking to work more proactively with media houses and big content publications like your own? Um, and what kind of things that they could be doing to, to kind of put compelling offers out there to engage them? Sure. So I think uh, for us personally, uh, you know, we kind of made a, a decision early, early on um, that we weren't going to let kind of like the dollars and the rev shares um, be the deciding factor for us. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, you try to get enticed with, oh, well, we'll up your, you know, rev share and, you know, so on and so forth. For us, it's really all it's been all about um, the audience and, and the user experience, you know, looking at things like price point, 
um, and categories and, you know, what's really going to resonate and serve our readers um, and, and make sure it's product that um, our editorial teams, you know, get behind and really believe in because um, they're the ones that are really, you know, stepping up here and creating, you know, super engaging uh, and authoritative content that people, um, you know, trust. So for us, um, you know, we're kind of looking at this from the perspective of what can you offer our highly loyal and engaged audiences that they can't get anywhere else, right? I, I think the the easiest thing to point to there is, you know, exclusive offers, right? Um, we've done this with some of our partners in the past, um, whenever it's made sense to say, you know, what what can you offer um, our audience again to kind of get them to, to take out their um, credit card uh, for us on the spot um, versus seeing something on our site and then maybe going to Google and trying to find a coupon code or whatnot for it um, before making the purchase. So um, again, that has kind of been the big one for us is wanting to work with partners um, that are willing to actually be in a partnership and not just say, we like you guys, you should like us, cover us, right? So um, we're really looking for that kind of back and forth um, partnership building um, element where, you know, we have really tight feedback loops. We're, you know, having conversations all the time, trying to find new ways um, of engaging audiences and, and going beyond just flat content, you know, saying, are there experiences we can build together? Um, are there other areas of our business we can um, work together on, you know, obviously we have a whole licensing division, we have an ad sales division, linear division. So um, there's really just so much um, for discovery um, yeah. in terms of what we can offer and then what we can take in. So um, yeah. those are those are kind of the big ones for us when we're trying to, um, you know, determine who we want to partner with and, and, and what that looks like. Yeah, sure. OK, thanks, Chris. Um, well, I'm now going to turn over to Dennis O'Reilly from Button. Uh, and Button, if you're not familiar with them, the mobile commerce platform that powers mobile business growth for brands and publishers, whilst also offering consumers more enjoyable online experiences. Um, hi, Dennis. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me. So as you probably saw earlier on one of the slides that uh, Awin, we've seen obviously this um, increase in mobile usage, which was something that we didn't necessarily anticipate given that people are locked at home in isolation, they've got access more to their um, uh, desktops and they're not quite as on the go as they would be in their ordinary lives. I wondered how, from Button's perspective, the lockdown has affected mobile activity and um, what you guys have been tracking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think mobile has really turned out to be a pretty interesting um, storyline here. Uh, because yes, we're seeing overall spikes and increases in traffic compared to the uh, pre-COVID pre or pre-PC era. Um, people have more time to browse, there's increased sessions, more usage at various times of the day, um, and more installs overall. Uh, that said, um, we do think it is being offset somewhat by people having their laptops close at hand. Um, I can't tell you how many virtual happy hours and surprise you <laughs> COVID birthdays I've been on. Um, and they all seem to happen on desktop, right? Because it's easier to kind of see your friends lovely faces on the big screen. Um, and there's like, you know, there's some really interesting literature and studies about this. Like the Times just put out a really interesting article that's pulling data from similar web and Aptopia that specifically for a lot of utility types of apps um, and a lot of um, uh, social apps that were connecting more frequently, but were connecting on larger formats, like in other words, uh, desktop computers and laptops and all that good stuff. I think, you know, that said, it's some of the usual suspects that some of the other panelists have mentioned and that you mentioned before, food, drink, business apps are seeing really high numbers. Um, in general, the direct consumer companies that um, have flexible supply chains because they're just the fact of supporting new orders um, it is a huge kind of factor in that. And many of these were the winners uh, even before this happened. And this is kind of like winnowing out that crowd um, quite a bit. I think, mm -hmm. you know, all in all, and it's going back towards opting for convenience and experience. Um, so what's really interesting, too, is I think since frequency purchasing has increased for a lot of the delivery companies and grocery and business apps, we're seeing more of the late majority and laggard people finally download these apps. Um, and it's really interesting because I feel like half the time I spend now is helping my mom 
you know, sign into different apps, um, <laughs> sign into different teleconferencing conferencing things, uh, to help her figure out different technology. And these are the same types of apps I've been telling her to use for years. So I think it's kind of just an overall kind of rise in tide for, for all traffic and uh, people are, are trying to make their lives easier with apps. Yeah, I feel your pain on the uh, parental IT support at the moment. So, uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, do you think this is going to have a lasting impact? I mean, those brands that are able to engage with uh, consumers in their apps at the moment, do you think that's going to be a lasting relationship? You know, I think it is. And I think creating that positive experience is really important right now because frequency is so high. So one reason that um, uh, people are using their kind of uh, or going and purchasing on desktop is because when they're at home, it's a very kind of passive user experience, right? And that's what's so interesting about smartphones is that, you know, before smartphones existed, um, like digital advertising and searching for things started with a Google query bar, right? It was like magic. You could just type something in and then you got it. You got whatever you wanted. Uh, and it was a very passive experience. But now people are doing that on the go when they're riding to work, when they're commuting, uh, when they're out with their friends, and it's more active and you have to really focus on the user experience. Um, so what we're kind of recommending and what we're kind of seeing is that, you know, get the groundwork in place right now, do your testing right now, figure out what's working, what's best, really create that connection with the user. Um, so once this all does break out a little bit, you'll still have that, uh, that position on a person's phone, which is often the most expensive real estate you can get right now. And you'll have, you know, somewhat uh, condition them to uh, think about your brand or your app in a different light. Yeah. Um, what advice do you think you have for brands that are seeking to drive affiliate traffic specifically to their apps at the moment? Mm -hmm. we're, um, we're recommending two big things right now. So I think in general, all apps and, and mobile companies should be capitalizing off the increased traffic that they're seeing, if they are seeing that. So it's a kind of interesting paradox because in many ways, right now is a terrible time to be doing user testing and to test mm -hmm. different products and different services. But in many ways, it's great because you can get results really, really quickly. So some tests that may have taken you know, two months or three months or a couple of quarters to reach that big can now happen in a couple of weeks because of these increase, uh, increases in traffic. Um, so we're recommending for, for brands that are focused on app or want to figure out the best way to uh, provide app commerce and affiliate is figure out which pages are working best. Figure out the types of user flows that are converting the highest, how frequently they're coming back and converting. Um, Understand when it's useful to push a user to install your app. Is it best to get them to install right away? Uh, do you see more LTV if you wait a bit till they get a little further down the funnel and then install? Um, what happens with users who purchase on mobile web and then you drive an install after the fact? So all of these are really important factors um, to help better under understand your audience and consumer behavior. We're seeing a lot of companies um, kind of pull back on other types of projects. And this might be a great time to allocate resources that, that you're not doing elsewhere. I think the other big thing is um, we're devoting a lot of time towards understanding the optimal commissions and the price elasticity of certain offers across our partnerships. So Button works across many cashback and loyalty apps, kind of powering their experiences and optimizing um, uh, uh, partnerships for those companies. And right now, advertisers need to be laser focused on the profitability of those channels and incremental lift, especially with so much organic traffic, right? So we're running personalization campaigns across all of these, along with a lot of price elasticity studies that show what is the cashback offer or what is the affiliate offer that drives the most profitable conversion? Because like everyone knows with affiliate, it hasn't been the most dynamic of industries, right? And any type of cashback app or site you go to, I often see the same cashback offer that my sister who has two kids and never travel sees, right? So there's big profit profitability gaps. So we're trying to make sure that we're testing um, uh, to really drive the, the most profitable tra traffic as we can. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that, Dennis. Um, yeah. And then finally, I'd just like to uh, speak to Amar, Amar Shah who's joining us from a firm, um, a company who are completely reinventing credit by offering customers the ability to pay over time with easy and transparent installment financing. 
Um, and customers can actually also shop on the Affirm app itself to discover brands and find exclusive offers such as interest-free financing. Hi, hi, Omar. Hi, how's it going? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So um, I wanted to first ask you a bit about what impact you think the, uh, the outbreak has had upon how consumers are really approaching payments online, um, particularly because we're seeing this massive uptick in the adoption of e-commerce at the moment. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think it's always great to, um, when you look at e-commerce, also think about the effect that payments actually has in facilitating that transaction and some of the trends we're seeing. Because I think what we're seeing with COVID is not only a large inflection point for e-commerce altogether, and I think all the panels have really talked about ways in which I think habits will change for both consumers and for merchants, but I think it's a massive catalyst for online payments as well. And so I actually see this in a few different ways. Um, one is I think just with more essential and everyday shopping needs going online, and as Den Dennis so nicely mentioned, getting those laggards uh, to actually adopt a lot of these new um, e-commerce uh, platforms and, and payment um, uh, methods, I actually think we'll just see much more comfort and adoption with online payments as a result. And a lot of that laggard behavior that, uh, if I can borrow that phrase that, that Dennis had mentioned, isn't just on the platform itself, it's around that comfort and security of, can I pay for this? And is it secure and convenient for me to pay for this um, online? And in this app or in this way, and I think we're gonna see a lot of people over that hump. The second thing is I think we're going to see a ton of um, increase around this buy now pay later model that we've been um, obviously a, a big pioneer in. Uh, last year alone there was really much an explosion in this space with over six million buy now pay later apps that were downloaded and I think we'll continue, continue to see this trend continue largely because people are both looking for more considered goods at this time but also given the economics uncertainty people are trying to stretch their dollar a little bit further and look for a more convenient and healthy alternative to credit cards. Mm -hmm. um, but the last thing, and I, the thing I'm most excited about is that, you know, when we look at the trends here, subscriptions or in-app payment purchasing or BOPIS, buy online and pick up in store, and even social commerce are all new payment habits that I think are really going to stick and even grow faster than we ever thought before. Um, and I think these consumers will start to see these innovative payment options more as a means of convenience, flexibility, and frankly, even necessity um, than they did before. And I think smart retailers will really learn how to lean into this um, trend. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating to think about the maybe slightly different demographics that are now coming online in a bigger way than we've ever seen before, largely because of the fact that they've been compelled to and the, the lockdown has meant that people who traditionally may not have instinctively gone to e-commerce options are now having to familiarize themselves with the user journey, with the platforms and how they work. And there's the potential, obviously, as you say, to have a lasting impact on the types of customers that brands are now interacting with on a frequent basis. Absolutely. Um, and, and we see this very much in, in our data as well. I think that there are um, and we've seen an overall increase in interest in the firm financing at this time, but I do think that there are kind of essentially two segments of, of customers. There are those that are actually in need and trying to manage through the uncertainty at the moment. And so having that ability to pay over time or um, you know stretch that dollar makes a ton of sense. But there are also other customers that maybe have more credit access and financial security, but again, are just thinking about ways to be smarter about their finances at this time, as well as just investing into considered purchases, whether you're gonna spring for that Casper or a uh, Nectar mattress or that Peloton bike, there's, uh, those are things that um, you, know, you may want to figure out ways to have more payment flexibility on. Yeah, and I guess that feeds into the, um, the notion that obviously a lot of Americans are facing big disruptions to their employment status and obviously their incomes and pay as well. And would that, from your perspective, do you think that there are a number of users that would now look at solutions like a firm and consider them to be much more attractive when, particularly when buying those larger value items? Yeah, absolutely. I think for those unfamiliar with a firm and, and how it works, uh, we provide installment financing that has no fees and we only charge simple interest. And so our consumers really can't go into a debt spiral. 
And the reason why I mention that way and why I think of this important is we've grown so much over the last several years because of this interest in a need for transparent and easy and predictable um, ways to pay and, and financing. And I think that's most valued in times of hardship and uncertainty. And that's exactly where we are right now. And so I think um, kind of those two trends that we're seeing um, uh, really are around consumers either um, unsure of their own financial standing, of their income, uh, of their even employment at this time, sadly, and also unforeseen expenses that can come up during this time period. And so they're wanting uh, ways in which they can gain access to both kind of everyday essentials as well as kind of those stretch goods as well. And again, I think that there's another segment of consumers that are just actively investing in conservative purchases more than than ever before while they sent shelter in place. And so we're seeing while a lot of people are, you know, spending on home and fitness and, you know, even auto um, being one area, auto parts and accessories being one area that's growing a lot. We're seeing that people aren't just spending on essentials, but they're also investing in their homes. They're investing in a new lifestyle, which is very much home-based, which is as much as they can work from home if they can, as well as making um, cooking a lot easier with home appliances or making home fitness a lot more comfortable or just finishing that project, um, maybe redecorating that room that they never got around to before, um, but now have loads of time to, to focus on. And so we're seeing those different trends play out. And I think, um, you know, we're excited to kind of help enable uh, as much as we can for for consumers during this time of need. Yeah. Um, one of the questions actually that's just come in specifically about a firm from the audience I've noticed is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Klarna, um, one of the other payment solutions. Are there any kind of distinct differences between what a firm are offering right now and, to, and, and what Klarna offer? Yeah, um, uh, there there are quite a few. Uh, I think the main thing that um, we are uh, that that we kind of see as its differences are one in the way that we structure our payment terms. So again, um, simple interest and no fees means that um, what you see is what you get, and our interests are aligned with the customers. Um, and so um, in that way, we we view ourselves very much as an honest and uh, transparent financial product. Uh, but the other thing is we have many more ways for our customers to pay, um, meaning more flexible terms. So you can pay for a firm um, purchases in three, six and 12 months traditionally, but also allow our uh, merchant partners that are integrated with a firm to actually offer a, a lot of variety of custom um, financing options, which makes it not only just easy to make a few payments on for for instance that warby parker sunglasses that you might get but also actually you know save up and 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 spend on the nectar mattress that you really want that's a thousand dollars as well and so in that way um, we try to make ourselves as useful um to a ver wide variety of categories that customers will be purchasing from okay thanks for that amar um, I've got a question here actually that's um, for Jen uh, that I would like to ask that's come in from the audience. Um, Jen, they've asked how you think the crisis at the moment may necessarily impact influencer strategies and partnerships in the future. And that's something I think is quite interesting in terms of whether or not there'll be a lasting impact on how brands connect and engage with influencers at the moment and whether this is going to have a, a kind of um, definitive change in, in what those partnerships look like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, for one, the value of influencers is going to, if it hasn't already, become abundantly clear to many brands. And especially now because, you know, for some of us, right, working from home is a new lifestyle and we have more time to potentially look into data and do more analyses. Um, it's a time really for brands to start looking at that data and looking at new customer growth and really like the, the true value of what their influencer program is doing. Um, and, you know, I would say, um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? It was just more to do with whether or not there would be any kind of lasting changes, I guess, in how mm -hmm. brands interact with influencers. Yeah, so the, the value piece is one and then pricing, right? So traditional influencer marketing looks at uh, views, they look at reach, engagement, all of these different types of metrics. I think now with brands kind of being forced to really focus on ROI, that model is going to be no longer. 
Um, so it's really looking at the influencers that are driving conversions and sales and new customers, as opposed to just um, good looking content that maybe has a strong reach. So that is that impact and kind of the switch to a model that looks more at um, the, the more incremental value of an influencer and the long term value of an influencer is, I think, here to change or I'm sorry, here to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've had a few questions come in from actually from a travel perspective, and I don't know if you've had, um, obviously that industry has been impacted um, most out of all right now. And I wondered whether or not there were travel brands that Magic Links had kind of worked with in the past who has worked with influencers and how, um, what the roadmap of recovery might look like that, whether those brands are still looking to kind of do promotional activity with them to keep them front of mind for consumers so that when those restrictions obviously uh, uh, are lifted, that those are the brands that consumers are still thinking of um, of booking their holidays away with. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Certainly there has been a pullback um, in that arena. And, and based on your chart, you know, we're seeing the same thing that you showed earlier. Um, but the content production, like from an aspirational perspective, is still happening. So it's more about um, looking into the future. You know, what are the most beautiful places to visit in the world? And while that person is not there, they can still speak to an experience or maybe they're pulling from something historically. Um, you know, but those types of influencers that are traditionally uh, focused solely on travel are certainly looking to other vehicles, whether, you know, category diverse. So um, maybe going into lifestyle or um, uh, different forms of, you know, like personal travel, whether that be like real or um, imaginative. Yeah, and um, that's a question actually that I'd like to also put to uh, Chris actually given Discovery's um, huge variety of content and um, some of the magazine publications that you guys have that focus on different destinations, etc. I wondered from a publisher's perspective what your content roadmap necessarily looks like for producing content around travel, whether you're having to maybe focus more on domestic destinations in the short term, simply because those are going to be the ones that are probably likely to be more accessible in that short to mid uh, range. Sure. Um, so I don't want to sound like a politician here, but we are taking it um, day by day kind of based on, um, you know, the outlook that we're seeing um, both domestically and internationally. Uh, you know, actually, before all this, um, you know, went down, we did make um, some other, you know, branding decisions on travel um, with both the Travel Channel brand and then also, you know, how can we bring some of that over to HETV? Um, because obviously, you know, a lot of folks who enjoy their home also enjoy traveling. So, you know, we were already kind of thinking or rethinking, um, you know, how we were going to cover travel um, across our different brands um, before this happened. Um, so we've really been taking it um, day by day on that front. Um, you know, we haven't been going all in. You know, we don't feel comfortable um, kind of throwing you know, travel and weddings and parties and all this stuff in front of um, folks face right now um, when none of us can really do that safely um, or are not allowed to do that. So um, for us, we've really tried to kind of just take a step back from that, rethink um, uh, our two, three, four week plan um, on the travel side and really just double down on the areas um, that we think are going to be most um, impactful for, for, uh, for folks during um, this time and again look I mean in two weeks if a lot of these restrictions start loosening and you know people are starting to feel more comfortable um, you know we'll kind of revisit that and you know see how we kind of want to um, toe that line um, but we've been um, super sensitive on that front because again we don't want to try to um, you know sit here and, and, and promote um, you know uh, things that we shouldn't be promoting um, you know given the asks from our government so um, you know, that's kind of how we're approaching it. I know it's a bit of a political <laughs> response, but um, it's very diplomatic <laughs> that, um, internally, because like I said, we don't want to, um, you know, seem like we're, we're th throwing all of this fun and exciting stuff in people's faces when they can't enjoy it. Yeah, sure. And um, to change tack slightly, one of the other questions that might be relevant from your perspective as well, Chris, is obviously to do with Amazon's changes to its sure. affiliate program. And that's caused obviously yep. a lot of consternation in the wider affiliate community um, and I wondered what your thoughts are on them taking these actions at this time. Sure, so I think, you know, first and foremost, 
uh, whenever this stuff happens, you know, whether it's a, a Facebook algorithm changing, uh, a Google algorithm changing, so on and so forth. I think this is when, you know, uh, as a publisher, you really need to take a step back and, you know, not rely so much on other people's platforms to survive, right? So um, this is something else that we really focused on heavily um, at Discovery was to diversify from the start. Um, you know, Amazon's a great platform. People love Amazon, great prices, great experience, you know, great through and through for um, the most part. But we said, look, Amazon's not the only partner out there. There's so many other partners. And again, from our perspective, we're looking um, you know, at the the end user first. Um, so we really, you know, try to focus our efforts on diversifying our uh, merchants um, in our portfolio and, you know, really doing what made the most sense for our audience. Obviously, Amazon's a very strong partners of, a partner of ours um, on many fronts of our business, not just affiliate, but some other areas um, uh, that we have. Um, and, and for us, I mean, obviously it stings a little bit. I think um, you know, no one would be um, uh, willing to say otherwise, I think, at, at this time um, for obvious reasons. But, you know, it is what it is. And um, this isn't the, the first um, group to do that. It's obviously not going to be the last. Um, you know, it's a business decision. And um, I think rather than, uh, you know, brands like ours kind of sitting there and harping on that and being like, oh, oh well, we just lost X percent of our you know, commission now and we're um, screwed for the future. Uh, I think this is a real, you know, um, again, opportunity in an unfortunate time um, to really, you know, make sure that you understand, um, you know, your purpose here and who you're actually trying to serve um, because there's plenty of merchants out there. Um, everyone um, has uh, things to offer um, folks, you know, whether it's inventory or um, shipping times or price points and, um, you know, for us, it, the most important thing is how can we get the best stuff out um, to our audience and, you know, pushing to Amazon when they're really just looking for non-essential um, or excuse me, looking for essential purchases right now. Um, you know, it doesn't do anyone um, any good for us to kind of, you know, point people um, in the direction of a situation that's, you know, not great. So, um, you know, again, there are strong partners of ours. We don't see that changing. Um, you know, this is just obviously an unprecedented time across the board and, you know, we're managing it that way. Um, but again, I think the lesson, I think not even a lesson, but just something that, um, you know, all brands should really, you know, focus on is that diversification. You know, I know a few years ago, the big talk was oh, just diversifying revenue streams and commerce was now going to be one of those streams. You know, we kind of see this now as how do you diversify your commerce streams? It can't just be, you know, how can you monetize um you know articles through uh, affiliate rep shares right it's really going beyond that building new experiences doing licensing partnerships um doing larger um kind of hybrid ad sales um deals where you kind of take the best of commerce and the best of ad sales and bring them together um and that's really been our focus to how um you know we've really been able to kind of navigate um this time and and, and pivot as necessary um you know as a business yeah yeah great thanks for that um just had a question in actually um i might put this one to you dennis actually um to begin with at least anyway and jess has asked um around the fact that the whole online industry is treading carefully at the moment when it comes to commercially benefiting from the increased traffic that they're seeing um, but Jess wants to know if any of the panel have experienced any negative PR or come across any negative PR or press around some of the brand responses to COVID-19 and uh, just asking about how how that's played out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question and there's been a trove of articles that talk about how brands are pulling back from digital ad spend, right? They're uh, pulling their TV ads, they're reformulating the kind of brand level experience to it. And I think what's interesting and what we're seeing with happening with um, uh, Google Shopping and uh, Instagram purchases is that this is going to hasten the shift from a lot of digital ad based spend on impressions and clicks uh, and actually push towards more transactional based partnerships or how we view uh, this as affiliate, right? And what we've been doing for a long time. So what Instagram shopping basically is just a, a seller's fee or an affiliate fee, right? So 
Um, what we often talk about, what my CEO is kind of stumps on, what I agree with them is, is this is almost like a, not COVID, but the broader time in pre-COVID was almost like a renaissance for affiliate because we're seeing a bigger shift towards more brand marketers look towards better performance and affiliate and revenue-based partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, so we think this is going to continue to push in that general direction. And what we're, he what we're hearing from a lot of brands is that all marketing and advertising has been pulled except for a lot of affiliate-based based partnerships because mm -hmm. it is very trackable. Uh, you know what you're getting. Uh, and also it doesn't come off as opportunistic because things are often organically interwoven where publishers can monetize. And you could see this perfectly clear on BuzzFeed, right? So I was looking at a uh, affiliate article about the 19 different non-medical masks that will get you through COVID, right? <laughs> That's effectively an affiliate article that they're kind of using to, to monetize, uh, but it's doing it in a very kind of organic or even positive way. So I think this is just going to kind of keep pushing the shift away from uh, more branding towards more partnership and, and commerce-based solutions. And I think the, the bigger duopoly of Google and Facebook are starting to take notice. So what's interesting is that for WeChat, um, which is one of the biggest apps in China, 90% or something like that of their revenue comes from transactional or affiliate-based partnerships. 10% comes from advertising. It's the flip side in the U.S., right? The, the vast majority of the lion's share of revenue that these um, publishers make is from advertising and CPC and impression-based stuff. Right. So I think we're starting to see that transition happen here. Uh, and COVID is just another catalyst for that. So um, in terms of kind of buttons perspective, we're just kind of another mobile is just another piece of what the, the broader industry typically sees. Um, but that's that's more of what we're hearing kind of come from from our brands and what the market is telling us. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks for that. Um... I just have one final question I was going to um, put out there. Amar, I might turn to you actually for now. And um, it's about the recent announcement that Google have made um, that they plan to make it free for brands to list their products in its shopping platform. Um, so this has been done uh, initially as a response to the current crisis with a lot of advertisers struggling to kind of um, get coverage out there and reach in terms of uh, reach connecting with their consumers and shoppers online. But it also looks like it might be a bit of an active desire to kind of move increasingly into that e-commerce space um, and compete with Amazon at the lower end of that purchase funnel. And I wonder just whether or not you had any thoughts um, about about this um, new move that they've made and, and its implications for um, for affiliates. Yeah, you know, I think um, Dennis also, I think, hit on uh, hit this really well um, with kind of a shift that we're going to see around really commerce-based advertising and um, actually leaning into a lot of the things that affiliate has done quite well um, you know in, in the past I think what it will do which I think is you know I think a really good thing and I and I put this in context with um, kind of the shift that that Amazon has made really well uh, or that, that has made recently which has caused a lot of impact on the industry which is I think one of the silver linings here is I think we're going to see a lot more emphasis on actual driving performance metrics, um, actual driving conversions and sales and new customer acquisition, um, which is what this all should be about anyway. And I think what it will force all publishers to do is be really ruthless about delivering those outcomes, measuring those results and actually delivering real value, um, not in just impressions and um, kind of more um, top of funnel metrics. And I think that will be a good thing, uh, I think, for the industry at large. I think it'll push a lot of innovation around how we think about attribution, how we think about payment, how we think about really making sure we're um, driving um, that conversion, not just through kind of our standard tracking mechanisms that we have today. Um, the, the second thing I'll say there is, I think it'll really help us also define, and I think ways in which other publishers can then respond to uh, to that is actually thinking about how they can be a better um, and more of a targeted partner for the advertisers and the merchants that they work with. So for instance, in some of the summary kind of slides that you shared about industry trends right now, it'll be really critical for us to double click um, on those and actually see what are the micro trends that our platforms are best suited to provide. Because I think 
people do come to Google Shopping for certain needs, but they also go to review sites or Instagram influencers for others, right? And so it's not going to be a, a one size fits all solution. And I think for us to double click, I think it will be interesting. I think we've seen from our own data, while electronics is doing well, gaming is doing 20 times better than the average of the category. And the same thing at home. Home is doing really well right now, but mattresses are doing five times better than the rest of the category. And so if we can really dig into the details, uncover some really interesting insights, I think we can all continue to deliver a lot of value for our merchant partners as well as customers in ways that really large platforms like Amazon and, and Google potentially can. Great, thank you for that. Um, well, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today and to delivering all of those insights that you've shared with us. And um, I just say to the audience that um, in conclusion, if you'd like to learn more about how Awin and Share a Sale are reporting on the impact of COVID-19 and its influence on the affiliate industry, then you can go to our dedicated coronavirus hub on the Awin website, or you can go direct to the Share a Sale blog. And both of those uh, resources are being regularly updated with our latest analysis and articles. In the meantime, however, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and participating in today's webinar and just wish you the best of luck for the future. Thank you and goodbye.